Well, I want to start today by welcoming all of you guys who are joining us, whether you're at uh, our Northgate campus or at Madras or uh, if you're joining us online. Uh, we're glad that you're here uh, for us uh, to go through this series today. Uh, I want to start by making like just a quick sort of true confession and just start out by saying this. As a sport, I hate running. And I know for some of you, uh, you hate to hear that because you, I know a lot of people who are runners and truth is i hate everything about the sport and again if you're a runner i i know what you're going to tell me you're going to tell me i haven't tried it long enough or i just don't get it and 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 that's fine the truth is i've tried it several times i still hate it i got people in my family who love to run uh my wife likes to run my daughter is even into it now uh, most of uh my family on that side they love to run in fact they're running the peach tree road race in a few weeks they all love running and I have nothing against you if you love to run. I will certainly be praying for you because I think you're probably a little weird. But for me, I despise everything about the sport. I hate everything about it. I hate the sound your feet make when you pound on the pavement over and over again. I hate the monotonous gasping in and, in and out for air. I, I hate how slow it is. It, I just don't have the patience for it. And, it, and here's the deal. I, it's not that I'm opposed to exercise. There are things I like to do for exercise, and it, most of them have a purpose, unlike running. But anyway, running, I just hate it. And, and my wife has told me over and over again, and I know this is true, all the runners that I know have told me the same thing. Most runners will tell you that the main challenge of running is not so much physical. It's actually a mental challenge because most runners will tell you, and, and I believe this is true, your body will go a lot farther than you think it will it's just that your mind tells you you can't go any farther and it wants to shut you down and the key to running is you have gotta train your mind to will your body forward in fact there's this thing that uh... runners will tell you that uh... you come to it's a point that you get to and all runners come to it it's called what they call the wall you ever heard anybody talk about this now how long it takes you to get to the wall when you're running is different depending on how well you're conditioned if if you're me, it takes me about 28 seconds. But the wall is that point where you're running and you get to the point where you can't go any farther. It's like you're just, you just want to stop. It's like it feels like you have burning coals in your lungs and, 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 and you feel like you can't put your foot forward another step. It feels like you have lead in your shoes and you just can't go another, another step. And your whole body just wants to quit. And every good runner will tell you that it's when the wall hits that your mind has to take over and you have to mentally will your body forward because you can go farther it's just you've gotta you've gotta will through it and every runner will tell you that when you run a race the race isn't won at the beginning and the race is really not won at the end the race is won at the wall it, 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 it's that question of it, it's the test of a runner C can you keep going when it feels like you can't go any farther and, and that's the question of, that every runner has to tell you, and every runner will, will say, if you can make it past the wall, you can probably make it through the rest of the race. But great runners always train themselves mentally to get their bodies to go farther than their bodies tell them that they can. It's the training to never quit. Now, here's the truth and the application of all of that. All of us are in the middle of some sort of race. And not not literally, but here's what I mean. In other words, you, you started something in your life. In fact, you started several things in your life, and, and, and it's different for everybody. You know, maybe, maybe you started an education or, or a degree, and, and you haven't finished that yet, or you started out parenting, and, you know, that's sort of a lifelong thing, or you started a marriage, you started a job or a career. Maybe you, you started a business. Some of you have begun a fight with an illness or uh, maybe a disease. You're in a struggle right now maybe with an addiction or depression or some kind of life controlling issue in, you li in your life and you've begun a fight against that thing. Now if you're a follower of Christ you have an important thing that you've begun. In fact it's the most important thing in your life. You've begun a relationship with your Heavenly Father. My point is we're all somewhere in the middle of a race and the question that I want you and I to deal with today and we're gonna wrestle this question to the ground how is your race gonna end are you gonna finish it well are you gonna push through the wall 
Are you going to move past that moment when it feels like you can't go any farther and you just, you just want to quit? Will you stop running? Will you lie down and die? Will you quit? Or will you keep going? Now, for the past few weeks, uh, we've been in a series uh, about the life of Moses, and you've already been sort of introduced to that uh, in today's service. And whenever Moses is written about in the pages of the Bible, one of the main themes in his life, you just need to know, is this idea of never quitting, of perseverance, hanging in there. In fact, I'm going to take you to a place to start off today where Moses gets mentioned, and it's kind of an unlikely place. In fact, if if you're Bible savvy and you're already turning to the story of Moses in the book of Exodus like we've been looking at, that's not where we're going to start today. In fact, what we're going to look at to begin the day off is we're going to look at the story of Moses not in the life of Moses. We're going to read something that was written about him generations and generations after his life. It's in the newer part of your Bible. It's what we call the New Testament. It's in a book called Hebrews, and you can go ahead and find the 11th chapter. Now, this section of the Bible, uh, most people have given it a name. There's sort of a title for it. They call it the Faith Hall of Fame, and it's simply because the writer uh, just lists all of these great heroes that you read about all throughout the pages of the Bible and how they had such a tremendous faith in God, and, and then the writer tries to apply it to us today. And He lists off all of these great names of these great people in the Bible, and he puts Moses right in the thick of it. In fact, Moses, he talks pretty extensively about Moses. And I want to read to you what he writes about the life of Moses. And if you've been paying attention uh, for the past two weeks, or if you paid attention to the little recap video you just watched, uh, you're going to recognize some of these events that we're going to read about. But this is from a writer writing long after Moses' life, and here's what he says. Verse 23, Hebrews 11. He says, it was by faith that Moses' parents hid him for three months when he was born. They saw that God had given them an unusual child, and they were not afraid to disobey the king's command. It was by faith that Moses, when he grew up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to share the oppression of God's people instead of enjoying the fleeting pleasures of sin. He thought it was better to suffer for the sake of Christ than to own the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking ahead to his great reward. It was by faith that Moses left the land of Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. And he kept right on going because he kept his eyes on the one who is invisible. Now, right there, that's sort of where we are in the story of Moses today, where we're sort of picking it up. Remember, he winds up uh, growing up in Pharaoh's palace. He's in Egypt. And even though he's in the palace and he's sort of with the royalty, he he feels bad for his fellow Israelites, his people who are out there as slaves. And he decides, I'm going to... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to step up and be their leader. I want to help them. I want to move them out of that. And so he, he tries to take ownership of that. And you remember last week we learned he sort of messed that up. He winds up killing another Egyptian and gets in trouble for that. And he's on the run for his life. And he, he flees the land of Egypt. And he, and he kind of thinks, well, that part of my life is over. You know, that, that whole dream of, of becoming sort of a liberator kind of person, that, that's just not going to happen for me. He goes to a place and begins to just sort of live his life. He marries and he begins to tend sheep. And then we learned uh, last week uh, that God hadn't given up on him, that God shows back up in his life and he begins to speak uh, to Moses again. And he challenges him. He comes to him in that burning bush that we saw last week. And he says, I want you to go back and try again. I want you to free the people of Israel. And this time I'm with you. You know, I'm going to help you do this. And remember, we saw how Moses argued about it, and he tried his best. He didn't want to do it. He tried to say no to God, but God persisted, and he finally gave in, and he agreed to do what God was asking him to do. Now, the writer of this passage of Scripture that we just read is just looking back on the life of Moses, and he's basically saying this. He's saying, look, Moses is an example of someone who hit the wall in his life. In fact, he had that happen several times, and he felt like quitting, but he never did. He kept his eyes on a prize, and he just kept going. In fact, I love this part. Once the writer of that passage in Hebrews gets through all of these great examples of people of faith, he makes an application, and he points it back to us. And look at what he says. This is chapter 12, verse 1. He says, Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, meaning all of the people that he's used in his example, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. 
see, there it is again. There's that image of a runner, and he's running a race. And But see, not not just someone who started the race well, because you know as well as I do, anybody can start a race. Anybody can stand at the starting line and start running. But he says somebody who runs the race with endurance, that's what Moses is an example of. In other words, the writer's saying, push past the wall. Don't quit. Now, today, here's what I want to do. I want to show you a moment in the story of Moses, a specific moment, where I think Moses hits his very first wall. So I want you to turn all the way back to the book of Exodus, and we're going to go into the story of Moses. We're going to start in chapter 4. And just to remind you, if you want to follow along with us, uh, the best way to do that in in your Bible is to download the CCC app. And inside the app, uh, you just click the Bible button, and it will always take you right to where we're reading today, and you can just follow along that way. It's the best way to follow along each Sunday. Now, remember when we left Moses last week, he was standing at that burning bush, and he's arguing with God, and he, he's saying, there's, there's no way I can do this. There's no way I can go back to Egypt. I can't approach Pharaoh. I can't get him to release the Israelites from slavery, and God reassures him. In fact, if you remember, he gives him some miraculous signs that he can do, and says, use that. And go impress Pharaoh. He shows him how to throw his staff down. It becomes a snake, and all this kind of stuff, and Moses says, okay, I'll do it, and he, he goes and gets his brother Aaron, because he, he wants some help, and takes Aaron with him, and they load up, and they head to Egypt, and Moses has a plan of attack. He, he has a plan of action that he's going to sort of uh, begin doing, and, and he, his, first, his first item is he's going to meet together with all of the leaders of the people of Israel. He comes to his own people, and he gets together the people who are sort of influential, and he tells them what his plan's going to be, and we pick the story up in Exodus 4, uh, verse 29. It says, Then Moses and Aaron returned to Egypt, and they called all the elders of Israel together. Aaron told them everything the Lord had told Moses, and then Moses performed the miraculous signs as they watched. The people of Israel were convinced that the Lord had sent Moses and Aaron. When they heard that the Lord was concerned about them, that he'd seen their misery, they bowed down and worshipped. Wow, success, right? I mean, can you imagine how, how well this meeting must have gone, how, how good this must have felt to Moses? I mean, he was so afraid. Nobody's going to believe me. This whole thing's not going to work. I'm not smart enough. I'm not, I don't speak well enough. This is not going to work. And he gets there, and he tells them, hey, God's come to me, and he's finally coming to your rescue. And, and, and here's the thing. Remember the context. These people, the people of Israel, they hadn't heard a peep out of God in 400 years. In fact, all they had at this point in their history were just stories. They had stories of how God had chosen them to be his people, and he told them he was going to bless them and bless the whole world through them, through, through, through what he was going to do in them, and then, then they're in slavery. And for 400 years, they don't hear anything out of God, but they keep hoping. But all they have at this point are stories and, and even just, just legends and promises. And so Moses finally shows up, and not only does he have a brand new word from God, he's got these miraculous signs. He looks to be legit, and, and it works. The Israelites get all fired up. They want to do the plan. They're thinking, man, let's do this. You know, we've got God on our side, and here's this dude named Aaron. He, he gives a pretty good speech, and here's the dude, this dude named Moses. He can even do, you know, cool magic tricks. This is great, you know. Let's go to Pharaoh. Let's do this thing. And we've been slaves for 400 years. How much worse could it get? <laughs> well, Exodus 5, verse 1. After this presentation to Israel's leaders, Moses and Aaron went and spoke to Pharaoh. They told him, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Let my people go, so that they may hold a festival in my honor in the wilderness. Now notice, they're really bold right here. I mean, think about it. They're standing in front of the most powerful man on the planet at the time, right? They got lots of confidence. Notice how they talked to him. They said, This is what the God of Israel says. And they don't hesitate. They don't take time to try and flatter Pharaoh at this point. They don't show him any of the miraculous things. They just get right to it. They demand what they're looking for. And and you might even say they're they're experiencing the runner's high that you get when you start a race and you're all excited and you got all the adrenaline. That's where they're at. But notice, it doesn't last too long. Look at what Pharaoh says next, verse 2. He says, is that so? And who is the Lord? And why should I listen to him? Why should I let Israel go? I don't know the Lord. I'm not going to let Israel go. 
Now, you might not have noticed this if you just sort of casually read the story, but the boldness factor is about to go way down when it comes to Moses and the Israelites. It says, Mo Aaron and Moses, verse 3, persisted. The God of the Hebrews has met with us, they declared. So let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness so that we can offer sacrifices to the Lord our God. Because if we don't, he'll kill us with a plague or with the sword. Now, just a few things that you need to know about this, this, this response. If you read the original language, they use a phrase in there that the nuance of it is kind of tricky, but it's sort of like begging. That They actually go in the first part from demanding that Pharaoh let the people go to just pleading with him to let the people go. There's another phrase in there that's interesting. They use the phrase, the God of the Hebrews. Notice the first time they said, uh, the God of Israel, the Lord. But now they're saying, the God of the Hebrews. It's different. See, this was the phrase. The second phrase is the one that the Egyptians used to refer to God. And it was their way of kind of referring to this tribal little know-nothing God that the, all the slaves just kind of worshipped. But they didn't know him, and he didn't have a whole lot of power. And it was, it was kind of like a lesser term. And notice, they're not asking for him to let the people go anymore. Notice what they asked the second time. They asked for a three-day pass into the desert. <laughs> and if you don't give it to us, God's going to kill us. It's, it's almost like Moses goes from saying, Pharaoh, this is what God says, and you're going to let the people go. And there's no compromising, and this is a demand. He goes from that to saying, well, if it please the king... Uh, could you at least give us a weekend pass? In fact, uh, give us three days, and we'll go out into the desert, and we'll be back to work by Monday. And, and, and listen, if you don't do this, God's really mad at us, and he's going to kill us, and you wouldn't want that to happen because then who would be your slaves then, and you wouldn't have a workforce. So, so Pharaoh, pretty please? <laughs> That's basically what Moses is doing. Can you imagine Pharaoh's reaction now? Well, he's not impressed. He's not impressed with the demanding He's not impressed with the begging. Verse 4, Pharaoh replied, Moses and Aaron, why are you distracting the people from their tasks? Get back to work. Look, there are many people in your land. There are, there are many of your people in the land, and you're stopping them from their work. Now, if you keep reading the, the story in this chapter, here's what Pharaoh does. Not only does he not let the people go, but he goes back to his palace, and he thinks to himself, man, if... If the Israelites have enough time on their hands to start talking about some, some God and going out into the desert and having some kind of trip out there, and wow, that, I must not be working them hard enough. They, they got too much time on their hands. So what he decides to do is he, he calls out all his slave drivers. He says, come in here. I got some news for you. We, we got some changes we're going to make. And, and here's, here's how it goes. Now, before this all happened, the Israelites had one main job as slaves in Egypt. Their job was to make bricks for the, for the construction projects that Egypt had going on. And in that time, the main ingredient of bricks was straw. And up until that point, Pharaoh and all his people, they would provide the Israelites with the ingredients. They gave them the straw that they needed to, break, to make the bricks. And they would just basically take the ingredients, put them together, and make bricks. And they had a certain quota they had to meet every single day. Well, here's what Pharaoh decides to do. He decides to change the game. He says, look, you got so much time on your hands. Here's the deal. I'm not going to give you straw anymore. You're going to have to go out, collect your own straw, bring it in, and put the ingredients together, and then make the bricks. Oh, and by the way, we're not going to change the daily quota. You're still going to have to make just as many bricks as you were before. And if you don't meet the quota every day, there are going to be beatings involved. Have at it. So, basically... All that Moses has now done for his people is, is, is this. He's wasted their time. He, he got their hopes up. He got their boss really ticked off. He, he doubled the workload and increased the punishment for them. I'd say that's not a bad uh, first day on the job for the new leader of the Israelites, wouldn't you? Now skip down to verse 19. The Israelite foreman could see that they were in serious trouble when they were told you must not reduce the number of bricks you make each day. So basically now they've heard the news. As they left Pharaoh's court, they confronted Moses and Aaron who were waiting outside for them. The foreman said to them, May the Lord judge and punish you for making us stink before Pharaoh and his officials. You have put a sword into their hands, an excuse to kill us. And it's at this point right here that Moses and Aaron realize something. They are now all alone. See, 
Pharaoh's against them because they stood up to him and, and he and like that. And now, all those people that were on their side before they went and, 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 and started the plan, they're against them. The whole nation's angry at them because now they've just made their lives harder. They've made the workload that much more. See, they thought things couldn't get any worse until they did. And, and see, whenever things don't work out like you planned, whenever you run up against serious opposition, whenever you realize that nobody's on your side and you're pretty much alone, that's when you hit the wall, right? That's when you feel like you don't want to go on. That's when you're tempted to just want to lay down and quit. Now, one of my favorite stories about this whole idea is about uh, a mayor uh, from Chicago. His name was Richard Daly. He was a mayor of Chicago for several decades, and I don't know for sure if this story is true. It's, it's been told as if it's true, but it's a great story anyway. Uh, one of the things that Mayor Daly was known for in Chicago was being a really tough guy to work for. In fact, as the story goes, uh, one of his speech writers came in one day and, and asked him for a raise. He said, you know, I've been writing speeches for you for a while. Could, could you just give me a little bit of a raise? And Mayor Daly looked back at his speech writer and he said, Look, you, you earn plenty of money. You, you, make, you make all the money you need to make. In fact, it ought to be enough for you to be able to work for a great American hero like me. And he sent him out. So the speechwriter left the office. Now, two weeks later, uh, the mayor was on his way to deliver a speech uh, to a convention of veterans. And it was a big deal. It was going to kind of get nationwide attention. And cameras were going to be there and everything. And Another thing that the mayor was uh, notorious for was he never read his speeches until he actually stood up to deliver those speeches. And so this one was no different. So he's up giving this speech to all of these veterans, and the cameras are on him, and he begins by saying this. He says, I'm concerned for you. I have a heart for you. I'm deeply convinced that this country needs to take care of its veterans, and so I'm, I'm proposing today a plan along with the city, the state, and the federal government, and I'm going to unveil today a 17-point plan to care for the veterans of this country. Now, everybody in the audience that day, they're, they're really curious. They're leaning in. They're thinking, what is the mayor about to say? In fact, the mayor himself was pretty curious as to what he was about to say. And so he turns the page on his speech, and the only words left at the top of the page were these. You're on your own now, you great American hero. <laughs> Well, that's where Moses is. I mean, that's, that's where he finds himself. Think about it. Moses, he's heard God's call. He was reluctant, but he, he followed, he listened. He, he did what God told him to do. He goes to the people. He, he starts the plan in motion, and he, and he thinks things are going to turn out all right, and then all of a sudden, bam, Moses hits the wall. And now everybody's against him. And it looks like this grand vision that he's given his whole life to for the future of Israel, it's never going to happen. In fact, he's made things worse for the people than they were before he got there. And Moses realizes he's all alone and he wants to quit. Verse 22, look what happens. Moses goes back to God. He protests. He says, why have you brought all this trouble on your own people, Lord? Why'd you send me? Ever since I came to Pharaoh as your spokesman, he's been more brutal to your people. And, and you've done nothing to rescue them. Can't you just hear it in his words? Moses is questioning everything about his life and about his mission. He's, he had a good start, but things are getting really hard now. It's not turning out like he thought it would. It, he's failing. He's struggling. He, he's hit the wall, and he wants to quit. Now, here's the question. If, if Moses is really doing what God wants him to do, and, and we know he is, if he's really doing God's will, if he's headed in the right direction, why in the world would God let this happen? Why would God sit back and allow Moses to hit the wall? And see, the reason I ask that question about Moses is because the truth is that's the eternal universal question for you and for me too. I mean, think about your life. You've hit a wall before. If you haven't, you will. Now, for some of you, you don't have to think too far in your past to think about a moment when you felt like this and you hit the wall because it's happened for you recently. 
Some of you, you're at a place where you were trying to get into the school that you wanted to go to, and you didn't get into the one you wanted to that you th were supposed to get into. Or maybe your career hasn't been quite as successful as you'd hoped or quite as fulfilling as you wanted. You started out in a marriage that has just every single day been a constant uphill battle for you. It's been a struggle. Or maybe you did everything right as a parent, you, 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 or at least you did the best you could. You, you did everything you could with what you had, and your kids haven't turned out as, at, at all like you'd hoped. You followed all the steps, and you, you thought you'd be out of the mess that you were in by now, but you've been working hard at it, and, and it just doesn't seem like you're gaining any ground, and there's no light at the end of the tunnel. Maybe you thought by this time in your life you'd have somebody to share your life with, but you're still alone. Some of you have been praying to God for something, and you've been praying for a decade or two. You've been praying a long time, and so far, no answer. And at some point, you just hit a wall, and you want to quit. And that same question comes back. You ask of God the same question that Moses asked of God. God, why does it have to be so hard? I mean, if, if I'm really doing what you want me to do, if you're really in this thing, God, why is it, why is it such a struggle for me? And, and, and why, is, why is it that things take so long to develop in my life? I know you've asked that question. I think we all have. And the truth is, I, I'd love to give you an answer that is complete and nice and tidy and satisfying. And to be honest, I don't think I can. I don't think the answer is, is, is very satisfying at all, to be quite honest. But I can say one thing. In fact, let me put it this way. One time, Jesus told a story. In fact, if you want to go back and read it, it's in a uh, book in the New Testament called Luke. It's chapter 18. Jesus was a master storyteller, and he tells a story about this topic one day, and here's how the story goes. He said, he said there was once a, a widow... And this widow had, had a need. He doesn't tell us what the need is. He just said she needed justice. And so she goes to a judge, and she pleads and begs for him to rule in her favor. Now, the judge, in Jesus' story, he, he's a corrupt judge. In fact, he's, he's evil. He, he doesn't care about people. He doesn't care about this widow. He doesn't care about her situation. He, he, he really has no concern for what she's asking him. And so he continues to turn her away. But the widow won't give up. And as the story goes, she just keeps coming and knocking on his door. And every day she's there and she just keeps pleading and begging and, and just persistent. She won't leave him alone. Finally, it, this corrupt judge who really doesn't care about the woman or her situation finally looks at her and says, if it'll get you to leave me alone, fine. Give her what she wants. Just, just stop bothering me. And he finally gives her what she's been asking for. Now, a lot of people will look at that story and they'll think, wow, Jesus is trying to teach us about God. You know, he's, he's teaching us that God is up in heaven and he has this stuff that we need and he doesn't really want to give it to us, but we've got to learn how to say the right words or, or we've got to figure out how to wear him down so he'll finally give us what, he want, what we want. <laughs> That's not the point of the story at all. In fact, if you read the story in its context, you'll find out exactly what the story is about. In fact, I want to read you just one verse out of that whole account. It's the very first verse of that chapter, Luke chapter 18, verse 1. It says this, One day Jesus told his disciples a story to show that they should always pray and never give up. See, here's the lesson for me and for you, and this is for you whenever you hit that wall. Whenever you're tempted to quit, on something you know God is leading you to do. See, sometimes the reason that you struggle in life, and sometimes the reason I struggle, and sometimes it's hard, and the, and the reason that things don't always precisely go the way we want, is simply this. It's because God knows there's something that you and I gain through perseverance that we can never gain any other way. There's something that you gain through persistence that you don't get any other way. Another writer in the Bible, his name was James. In fact, James was Jesus' brother. He writes a book in the New Testament, and here's the way he puts it. He says, brothers and sisters, when troubles come your way, in other words, when things get hard, when you hit the wall, 
consider it an opportunity for great joy, to which we read that and we go, what, how, can, how can hitting the wall, and how can that be joy? He says, because you know that when your faith gets tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance gets fully developed, then you're perfect and complete, needing nothing. See, here's the truth. I would never wish on you or anybody else that you would hit a wall, that life would be a struggle for you. I don't want that for you. I don't want that for me. But here's the deal. When I think about people I know who have experienced the wall, you know, when, when things have gotten so hard that the easiest thing for them to do would be to stop praying, throw in the towel, compromise on what they knew was right, and just go their own way and just give in. And, and they could have done that, and they choose not to. They choose to persevere. They choose to hang in there. They choose to not quit. Those are the people who have something in their life that I know they would have never gotten if they had not experienced the struggle and the waiting. It's like I think of some friends of mine, and they prayed and prayed and prayed for years that God would give them a child. And for years the prayer went unanswered, and they struggled, and they worked, and they went all different kind of avenues to to, to make that happen and they hit wall after wall after wall after wall to the point where most of their friends would look at their life and say why, why do you keep torturing yourself why do you keep beating your head up against that wall it, 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 it's, it's not worth it just give it up just, just let it go and they kept struggling and they kept working and they kept praying and they kept waiting and they will tell you today looking back on their life that they have more growth and more learning in those years of waiting and hitting the wall than they would have ever gained had life been easy for them and everything had been handed to them. Because sometimes, sometimes, and here's the principle you need to write down, sometimes the gift that God wants to give you and me is the gift of growth. Sometimes the gift God wants to give you most in this life is the gift of growth. And growth only comes when you keep running and running, way past the point where you think you ought to give up. And some of you are right there right now, and you're wondering, what am I gaining right now? Because it seems like everything's hard, and everything's uphill, nothing's easy, and it seems like you're just waiting around for something to happen, and you keep praying the same old prayers, and nothing's getting answered, and you wonder, can I, can I, should I just quit? Should I, should I hang in there? Is it worth it? And I'm here to tell you, don't quit. Just keep praying. Just keep running. I mean, you started the race. Don't stop now. Don't stop when you hit the wall. Because the race isn't won in the start. The race is only won if you can finish it well. See, when you quit, when you quit on what God has called you to do, one thing I know for sure is you'll never see what God wants you to see, and you'll never experience God in your life. See, if Moses has decided that that moment right there when he hit the wall, it, he said that's it for him, can you imagine what he would have missed? I mean, most of you know how the story ends. Can you imagine? In fact, I love the very next verse. After Moses goes and he, he pours out his heart to God, he gives him all his complaints. He says, why would you send me? Why, you know, all that stuff. If you stop reading the end of chapter, uh, chapter 5 in Exodus, you miss the rest of the story. In fact, you miss the best part. But look at the very first verse of chapter 6. Moses says, God, why would you bring me here? God, why is it everything against me? Why is nothing working? Why aren't you doing something? And the Lord tells Moses, verse 1, Now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh. I love that verse. It's my favorite part of the story. See, this whole time it was never, it was never about Moses. See? It, it, was, it was never about the plan. It was never about his speaking ability. It was never about the miraculous signs that he could do. This was always God doing something for his people. And see, I think that God just simply needed Moses to come to the end of his ability in order to get Moses to trust God enough to let God work through him. But that's what it took. It took Moses hitting the wall before he finally ever realized it. This is not about me. This is about what God is going to do. And he finally was able to sit back and allow God to work through his life, and he got in on the adventure. Listen, today, I don't, I don't know where you're going to run into your next wall. Maybe you've, you've hit it recently. I don't know. But I know everybody hits the wall. Because I know everybody gets tempted to quit sometimes. And, and perseverance, it's a challenge for every single person in every life. So I just want to give you one last thought. I want to give you one last verse, in fact. I'm going to encourage you to take this verse we're about to read, 
commit it to memory and you just just walk around with it all week long and this this verse will help you galatians chapter 6 verse 9 so let's not get tired of doing what is good what is right because at just the right time we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up that's great words now you guys know every week we encourage everybody who joins us every Sunday to take a next step in your relationship with God. So right now I want to encourage you to do that. I want to ask you to take the connection card that you found on your seat when you got here today and take that pen that was there. And I'm going to encourage you to begin to look at the back of that and, and begin to fill that out for us. I mean, th this is, this is, these are things you can do. There are several steps on the back of that card that you can take this week, and they'll help you put this whole idea of perseverance into practice you know maybe your next step is you just need to memorize that verse we just read and you need to commit it to memory and walk around with it all week long let it guide your thoughts when when you feel tempted to want to give up and want to quit just recite that verse and remind yourself you know better things are coming if we don't give up don't get tired of doing what is good M maybe your next step is simply you just need to commit yourself to persisting in prayer you know you need to be like that woman in Jesus's story because you've been tempted to give up recently and to stop praying because you don't feel like it's working. This week you need to pray for persistence. And there's a place on the card you can indicate that decision. You can even write down your own next step. Maybe there's something you want to accomplish over the next few weeks related to this or maybe even not. And you want to take that next step. Write it in if you need to. Maybe your next step is you need to begin to connect around here because you're feeling disconnected and you need to be a part of the connection process at Community Christian. You need to uh, attend Starting Point. You need to attend a, a group or a serving team. Whatever your next step is, we're asking you today, just indicate that on the card. And at the end of the service, the offering's going to come around and we just ask you to drop that in and we'll pray for you. Let's bow our heads right now and I'll pray. God, I pray for those who are joining us today and they feel like they've just hit a wall in their lives. I pray for people who maybe not have hit a wall recently, but God, it's inevitably coming in their future. Father, will you remind us today, like you did for Moses, that it's not about us. It's about what you want to do through our lives. And in times when it feels like it's a struggle, I'm asking you, God, just give us the gift of growth. Develop our hearts, develop our character as we learn to persevere and never give up. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.